He represents Silicon Valley in Congress, and he co-founded the Antitrust Caucus in the House. A man of contradictions. Please welcome Congressman Ro Khanna. Thank you so much for being here. Now let's start with this, and obviously it's not the most important topic. I imagine many of your most annoying constituents were trapped at Burning Man this weekend. <laughs> Uh, my social media feed. <laughs> uh, what, if anything, uh, could you have done to keep them there longer? <laughs> well, well, they they feel like they've dis that's their uh, spiritual journey. That's their morality. So uh, you know uh, th that's part of the problem. That, uh, <laughs> that maybe they just need to have uh, a different form of getting ethics. You view that as entertainment. Okay, I support that. Uh, so you've got to be the only member of Congress, and maybe the only human being, who has gone on both Hugh Hewitt's radio show and Bad Faith, which is like a very lefty podcast. Yeah. You've gotten beaten up, beaten up on both. I assume. <laughs> you're also now on this show. Is there anything you say no to? <laughs> well, I, I know you've got like comedians and famous folks, so I, I, I thought you needed a boring segment in between. So no, it I, is. It's a <laughs> you know, the, the, the serious, serious yeah. section. That's great. But, but I do think, like, jokes aside, like a lot of politicians wouldn't do either. Um, what do you see as the value? Like, what makes it worth your time to go on, say, like a right wing show where you know you're going to get the shit kicked out of you? Part of the problem, I think, in our politics is we have way too much certitude, way too much sense that we know the truth. Uh, what we have is morally superior. We're not going to engage with the other side. I grew up in a belief that you engage other people, you listen to other people, you don't come with a view that you know everything. So going on these shows, I mean, sometimes I vehemently disagree, and sometimes I want to hear the other side and engage in conversation. And I know it sounds simplistic, but if we just had more conversations in this country, genuine conversations, not I want to go on Fox News because I want a viral clip to, to go share with other people, I think we'd do far better as a country. So... We, we've been talking about this just in how we make this show and, and just that there is a sort of a lack of humility sometimes on the left, that there is a kind of sense that um, and, and on the right, obviously. But how do you strike the balance between, hey, we don't have all the answers and we should talk to each other. And uh, there is a there's sort of a, a point at which our values dictate that, like, no, no, we're not going to debate certain things. We're not going to go certain places, talk to certain people. Well, there's certainly a, a, a line. I mean, you're not going to go on to a show of uh, someone who's uh, espousing blatant, uh, virulent racism, Nazism. But a couple of points. One, the idea that people say, well, Ro, you're going on Fox and you're platforming Fox. I said, Fox doesn't need Ro Khanna. They've got millions of viewers. It's not maybe they'll have like three million in my mom or something if I go on. But it's not like I'm adding that many. Second, you look at times in a country which were more divided. Look at Lincoln. I mean, Lincoln didn't go in and, and just say, well, you're slaveholders, you're terrible, though they were. He tried to win through the force of argument. Dr. King tried to win through the force of argument. Gandhi, the person who inspired me because of my grandfather uh, in India's independence movement, I mean, he would go and talk to British colonizers. My view is that the way we're going to move this country forward is by having the merit of the argument and making the best argument. And that has sort of become passe. It's like let's the, the, the idea is almost to embarrass, to shame, that has a place. But what about just the force of reason that has actually worked in American politics? I still believe it could work. So we're in the middle of a strike in the entertainment industry that has now lasted more than four months. A lot of the contentious issues relate to how the business model has changed in television and film. That's about streaming, but it's also about a bunch of consolidation. That's allowed just a few companies to control a huge part of the industry. Can you talk a little bit, as someone who has co-founded the chair, the, the caucus on antitrust, what role you think antitrust regulation could play in making the entertainment industry a fair place? Well, what I say is technology is not a license for exploitation, right? I mean, we look at the strike very simply. And you used to, if you wrote the Friends or you wrote Seinfeld, when you'd have the reruns or when it would get uh, syndicated, the writer would get compensated. Now, if you were the writer for Ted Lasso or the writer for a show that does well, uh, you, Apple or Netflix aren't even telling you how many people are streaming that. And they do have way too much market share because how many people do you have a choice of in uh, going to these services? So 
in this case, I would just have regulation that would require them to disclose the amount of people who are watching a show and compensate based on that. And that's why I stand with the writers and what they're doing. But I think more broadly, we do need to look at market concentration and make sure that when you have companies, you don't have unfair concentration so that you have power uh, over workers or over consumers in, in unfair ways. I mean, it used to be there was there were rules that create a dividing line between, say, networks and studios. And you see this in a bunch of different industries, right? That, you know, the the networks control uh, the way people see the content. They also make the content. Amazon controls the store. They make stuff for the store. Apple controls the app store. They make stuff uh, for the store. Are there more structural changes that you would see, at least in entertainment, that fit with this sort of problem? Like, would do you think it's right that um, uh, that a company like Comcast – or could own, they could own the cable, they can own the, the network, they can own the studio making the content, that they can own the whole thing top to bottom? Traditionally, vertical integration, which you're talking about, hasn't been an antitrust violation, but, but I do think that there's a problem when you have Apple or Amazon not only making the content, but then privileging the content. So Amazon's making products, and then they're, suddenly when you go on to Amazon search, those products come up first or Apple's making a, a streaming service and then they're prioritizing that in the App Store. What I would require is uh, neutrality, that if you are going to have uh, one of these products that you're making, you can't favor it over other products. And that was actually Klobuchar's bill, which I thought was a, a very good start, uh, and unfortunately we didn't get it passed. So on August 15th, there was the so-called last rights meeting between Amazon and the FTC. First of all, great name for a meeting. Uh, way to go. Uh, the FTC is expected to file a suit against Amazon inside of this month, according to the Wall Street Journal. What a surprise, given Lena Khan's whole essay on well, Amazon. I couldn't have anticipated that. Well, that's right. Yeah, so so I, it's actually an amazing thing. So you were, you were representing Lena Khan, who is the, the head of the FTC. She wrote, when she was an academic, a paper call about basically Amazon's anti-competitive practices. Paper. And now she's the head of the FTC and they're pursuing this. Is that the first example of something from academia mattering? <laughs> Can you name another? No, but but, but but what do you make of the fact that they're, they've had uh, this John meeting? John Maynard Keynes once said, every politician is beholden to a dead economist. They just don't know that. So, uh, you, you know, the-, the That's the, good the, defense. The, 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 the academics- the Yale, You're a Yale person defending the, the, a Yale person. Academics have, unfortunately, I think academics have mattered in a, in, a, in a bad way where they haven't taken into account the offshoring of jobs and the working class and middle class and have been too much for free market economics. And Robert Bork- basically got these judges to say anything that maximizes consumer welfare is fine. Who cares about jobs? What I would say is surprising with Lena Khan is she is an academic who has prioritized jobs and families and communities, not just economic efficiency and mattering. And I think that that's actually a sea change in the type of academic literature that has influenced people for the last 40 to 50 years, where it was heavily dominated by sort of free market e e economics. So I was going to actually ask you about that. So what you're talking about is there's this philosophy, it's from the right, on how the courts have handled questions around antitrust. And it basically says that if it has a, it's about the impact it has on consumers. That's the most important thing. And if these airlines can say that they'll be able to lower prices, all the other stuff doesn't matter. Uh, this is part of a pushback against that. You've seen the Department of Justice say that a merger in the book industry between, I think it's Penguin Random House and Simon & Schuster, couldn't move forward for the reason that it would affect authors' ability right. to sell books. Do you see... Kind of a lot of this will end up in in the courts. You've seen the courts refuse to go along with the FTC's efforts to delay this Microsoft Activision Blizzard acquisition. What is the hope of any kind of antitrust regulation in a world where the right has such a hold on the courts? And and what is that? What is going on in this effort to kind of change the the sort of legal philosophy on these questions? We're expecting too much from Lena Khan. She is can only operate within the current judicial framework. We need Congress. I mean, Congress has to change the law. And when antitrust first came about in the Wilson area with Theodore Roosevelt, there was a sense that in America, everyone should be able to make a living. And if you were a small business owner, you should be able to make a living. 
and you shouldn't have these, just have these big corporations dominate democracy, that you couldn't have powerful economic interests dominate democracy. That was the guiding philosophy. Then somehow it just became uh, perverted and became economic science and saying all we care about is efficiency and all we care about is consumer welfare. That philosophy actually, in my view, is what destroyed the middle class and working class in this country because we said it doesn't matter if corporations want to go to the cheapest labor off offshore, lowest environmental centers. All we want to care about is cheap prices, corporate profits, and the same thing influenced antitrust doctrine. To change that, we need Congress to step in, and Congress needs to say that we, uh, there are other considerations, jobs, community, people's livelihood, and that those are factors that should be taken into account. Uh, Amy Klobuchar, uh, we in the House tried to do that. Uh, it didn't have the votes, uh, and now the Republicans are in charge, so we need to have the House and the Senate to be able to get it passed. In the absence of that, what did you think of the Biden administration's rules that they put out uh, in July uh, laying out a firmer antitrust regulations? I think that, that that was a good start, and that will guide people like Lena Khan and the Justice Department to take stronger action. Uh, it will curb some of the worst practices because they know there's an activist division uh, at, at in the FTC and justice, but it can't take uh, away the courts, right? I mean, the courts are still going to be ruling, unfortunately, often against the the agencies because the law hasn't changed. But I think that the frustration, John, a, 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 on antitrust, it speaks to something deeper. I represent a district, Silicon Valley, that has $10 trillion of market value. It's literally one third of the S&P 500, Apple, Google, Intel, Yahoo, Cisco. You've had the concentration of obscene amount of wealth in places like the Valley, New York, LA, and at the same time, when you go around the country, you go to Johnstown, Pennsylvania, you go to Ashtabula County uh, in Ohio, you go to Downriver, Michigan, you go to Dayton or Milwaukee, you've had the total collapse of the working class, of the middle class, where people don't believe in the American dream. And people are saying, how have we allowed this to happen? Antitrust is just one part of the issue. The bigger problem is the concentration of economic opportunity in a few places where so much of America has been left out. So... You, you, you make reference to this concentration of wealth in your district, like Apple, for example, the first ever company to have $3 trillion in market cap in one, in one entity. Uh, you talk a lot about, and you're passionate about, the ways in which companies can abuse scale to, um, to dominate a market um, or to control an industry. Do you, do you view that concentration in and of itself as a problem? Do you believe that a system that is working should be able to produce companies of this scale? Well, I don't have a problem with Apple computers being a big company. I have a problem with specific applications. I don't think they should be charging 30% in the app store for an app developer. I think they should have more openness in their app store to uh, competition. Uh, I believe that there needs to be no market dominance in a particular industry. Uh, so I would look at their market share in different industries. But if you're scaling because you have a really cool design or you've done something that's uh, a, a, a very popular, I don't have a problem with that. It's the abuse of that position that I have a problem with. Do you think that like companies like Amazon should be able to like you, your your focus is on making sure that they don't privilege the products that they make. But in a certain certain sense, what they're doing, even when they're not privileging their own products, is they're using their vast market power, their size, to go into industries where they're competing against much smaller, much less well funded firms. Right? Like Apple can go into the entertainment business and become a competitor overnight, buy up movies by Martin Scorsese, even though they weren't in the industry two years ago. But they can do that right because of the scale they have dwarfs anything that anyone in this town can compete with. Like, isn't there some sense in which uh, it, that 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 size itself is sort of part of the problem, that it is anti-competitive in and of itself to have a company uh, that is so much bigger than anyone else <laughs> around them like, or five companies? So I think it depends on what you're saying. If you're saying, OK, you make a very good phone and you're just selling that phone and you're building the size, that to me is less problematic if you're not engaged in dominant behavior than if you're 
trying to acquire something in a different industry right. and getting into the, a different industry by uh, undercutting them. Uh, I would be much more vigilant on not just uh, approving the acquisitions and mergers, which actually I think one thing the Biden administration has done. They have really uh, limited and scrutinized those kind of acquisitions and mergers, and they're considering the impact on a community, the impact on jobs, and that I do think is a concern. So I would say it's not as much size as much as expanding into other industries, leaving communities hollowed out because you don't care. No, 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 I know. I've just sort of like, they're like sitting on all this money and there's like, I don't know, I guess we'll make a fucking car. <laughs> you know, like it's, it is wild to have this company that has so much money that even before you get to their expansion, that whatever, would, that, that the profits that throw, that they can throw off, whether it's not paying workers enough or having market dominance or what have you, leaves them in such a position that they have so much cast are like, I don't know, let's start a movie studio, I guess. Like that's, that's, like this is a strange situation. It, it is a very strange situation. They've been beneficiaries of, in part, lax antitrust laws, but they've also been beneficiaries of a winner-take-all global economy where uh, you now, if you're uh, the winner, don't just sell to Los Angeles. You can sell to all of the United States. You can sell to the whole world, and those are the profits. But I guess, to me, the bigger question is not why have we allowed Apple, though that is an important question that there should be stronger antitrust issues. There should be, in my view, more tax. This is one thing I never understand. I represent more billionaires probably than any congressperson, and I'm for a wealth tax and taxing them, and I keep getting elected to Congress. I don't understand how there's a hard vote for any other congressperson. But, I, but you I, do I, know why. I, I, but you I do mean, know why, right? Because because a billionaire, because you know, Warren Buffett talked about how he's trying to get the billionaires to take all that pledge, and he yeah. joked about how he wanted to write a book called How to Live on $500 Million, uh, <laughs> <laughs> because he couldn't get enough yeses. Uh, because rep, because representing a hundred billionaires, they're easier to tax than uh, than a thousand millionaires. I tax the millionaires too. I mean, I I guess I I, I guess the point is that one we, this country has not had enough progressive taxation on, yeah. on the ultra wealthy. I would say someone over a million dollars is ultra wealthy. Uh, it, we haven't had sufficient. Uh, antitrust enforcement. What you're saying, but there's a bigger problem, John. We saw this wealth concentrate in time after time, and we, we, we did nothing in communities after communities that were destroyed. One of the famous things, which I know you know, when President Obama in 2004 spoke about Galesburg and the Maytag factory leaving, I was just in Galesburg 20-some years later. Nothing has changed. Those kids in that community, they're still leaving. The economic opportunity isn't there. And you go town after town in this country in white, black, Latino areas that have seen the American dream leave, and that's why people are angry, that they're angry at the institutions that have failed them for the past 30 years. And the question, really, we have to ask ourselves, yes, let's have antitrust law, let's, let's tax the wealthy, but what are we doing to redevelop, to have real economic opportunity in those places? And the reality is, you know, in some of those places, they're, they're worse than, 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 than developing parts in, in, in other countries. And we just, we didn't do enough as, as a country. What do you think is like, like, there does seem to be just sort of a missing part of the national debate and even just the way we talk about economics because, you know, there's, we talk about a national inflation rate, we talk about a national unemployment rate, we talk about uh, 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 national income, and then you go into the, to the actual data and in the same way that, you know, they adjust the number seasonally, they don't. You, what, what we never see is a report that says, "Hey, for, hey, it turns out for the last say uh, ten or fifteen years, we've had incredible, unrelenting economic growth in these ten cities." And actually, if you go to seventy percent of the country, they've been in a state of like we talked about it that way. That hey, this whole part of the country has been in a permanent recession since say like nineteen ninety seven, and nobody's right, really right. talked about it. I think that explains so much, not all of our politics, but so much of the anger at our politics. I mean, it's it's actually pretty simple. People used to have thirty buck jobs. Now they have fifteen to seventeen dollar jobs working in Amazon warehouses instead of steel plants. So yeah, the unemployment rate may be three point five percent, but those aren't family sustaining jobs. And then they've got ten thousand dollars for childcare, and they've got I don't know twenty thousand dollars, thirty thousand dollars if they want to go to college, and they've got medical debt, and most young people can't think of even buying a house. And then they hear all these politicians saying, well, things are going in the right direction. They say, no, they're not. No, they're not. Now, I give the president a lot of credit for trying to steer the Titanic in the right direction in terms of what he's trying to do. But he's trying to reverse 
decades of policy. And I think that's the balancing act for Democrats, which is to, to acknowledge that the working class and lots of parts of this country have really been left out. We're in the middle of yet another mini kerfuffle about the fact that, I don't know if you know this, but, but President Biden's old. Um, uh, and that is a fact, he's old. Uh, there's, an, there's another round of sort of, I think, Democratic hang, hand-wringing and polling. Voters are clearly concerned about uh, Biden's age, but at the same time, especially because Republican extremism is dangerous and makes the stakes feel total, Democratic voters and politicians are also risk averse. And so there's no appetites or participants in any kind of, there's no appetite or participants in a primary. Um, so how do we get out of this loop and get from concerns about Joe Biden's age as his liability, as a biggest liability, which it is, and to the, to the hard work of, in a, in a world in which he is on, on track to being the nominee, uh, doing everything we can to make sure that he uh, stays president? First of all, no candidate is perfect. Uh, the person who I believe is the most talented politician of modern times, Bar Barack Obama, was two years into his Senate term. That was a legitimate criticism of him when he was running for president. How can you become president having two years as a Senate? Bill Clinton was the governor of a very, very small state. So, yes, President Biden is old. Like, no one is going to – you can't have anyone assume the presidency, even Democratic politicians we've had, and not have something that – you could say, well, I wish I wish he was 65. Sure, I wish he was 65. But look at what he has achieved. Look at the Inflation Reduction Act, the Infrastructure Bill, the CHIPS Act, which actually brought $20 billion to Ohio. I often say this. If Donald Trump had brought $20 billion to Ohio in new factories, we'd be hearing about that every day. Look at what he has done on the American Rescue Plan. I talked about child care and the cost of child care. 70,000 facilities have child care today because of that plan the president passed, and that's going to go away if the Republicans don't have the budget. And look at his leadership on Ukraine, where he has shown judgment. It's easy to say, let's support Ukraine. He's done that, obviously. He's rallied NATO. But you know where he's shown judgment? He hasn't gone further in provoking a world war with Russia. That's a very fine balance that he's managed to strike. So... He has extraordinary experience. He has done a lot. He can win in the Midwest, and I think he deserves a second term. But, <laughs> and by, by the way, you know, all this polling, someone said, oh, there's a poll showing Nikki Haley up. You know, we, we didn't have President Dukakis. We didn't have President Gary Hart. Like, the polling right now is kind of irrelevant. And Biden, I, I co-chaired Bernie Sanders' campaign. Mm -hmm. I never thought Joe Biden was going to win that nomination. I thought it was going to be Bernie or Warren. Let me tell you something. He's been underestimated. I underestimated him. He's resilient. He's tough. And anyone who doesn't think he has the steel, I mean, this is someone who's run for president three times. I mean, that takes a lot of guts. He's run after he lost his son. I mean, it's, it's a person of character. And I think people are underestimating him again. Uh, did you underestimate him when he became president, too? Uh, being honest, I, 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 no, no, but sincerely, like— I. Do you ever stop and think, holy shit, Joe Biden is not – obviously, I'm going to go on television and say he's good, but he's far better than I ever, like, imagined. Like, I, you know, like he's a – I'll tell you why I underestimated him, and I'll, I'll say this, and I – you know, I grew up admiring John F. Kennedy, right? And people say, well, Lyndon Johnson, he passed uh, the Medicare uh, Act, he passed the Voting Rights Act, he passed the Immigration Act. But we name all the streets after John F. Kennedy because John F. Kennedy sang the song of America, right? And Barack Obama sang the song of America. And Joe Biden doesn't. Like, I, I'm, not, I'm just, he loves America, but he's not that. And so, but when you look at, okay, forget that he's not Obama. He's actually got all these relationships experience and he's getting things done. I think because I so prized the inspiration, just personally, I didn't appreciate enough the skills that he had. Well, the skills he has is he knows a lot of people in Washington. He's honest. He's effective, and he gets a lot of things done, and he's very gracious, and he's, he jokes around. You know, he's, he, when I first met him when he was president, he says, oh, I, you're the, you know, I know you supported Bernie. You're, you're for Medicare for all, bro. I am too. I just don't think there's a shot in hell that's ever going to get done right now. So, you know, and then he's like, he's, he's jovial, he's humble, uh, and he's effective, and I I probably undervalued some of those skills and and he's and he you know the other great things about Biden he has the humility to know that the party changed he listened to young people he listened to Bernie he listened to 
AOC. He listened to Elizabeth Warren. He listened to the moderates, too. But he went where the median of the country was. And that takes a lot of, uh, actually, wisdom to say, look, I'm not going to be the same person. I'm going to listen to where the country is moving. And, and the power the power of his reputation and having been around a long time, ironically, made it possible for him to shift left without being tarred for, by the right as having become some some lefty. Like they've been trying for years to yeah, paint Joe is, Biden this way. It won't work. This is his skill. He, the same policy Bernie Warren says, oh, radical left. Joe Biden says, oh, it must be middle America, normal America. And so he's, he's taken a lot of policies and really made them uh, mainstream. But I, look, I, I think it is foolish to do anything but be all in for Joe Biden. If you want Medicare for all, as I do, if you want free public college, if you want massive investments in uh, climate, the way to get there, the way to get a progressive future is to have eight years of Joe Biden and then push for it, not four more years of a Republican or Donald Trump. So I I think we've got the one thing that concerns me, John, on the, the only you know, I'm not a bedwitting, wedding Democrat, and I think Biden's going to be fine, is that I don't see yet the same urgency that we had when Trump was there, and that was because Trump was in our face, yeah. and we knew how bad it was. But we got to get that same passion. If we get the turnout, we'll win. Last question. Are you still on threads? Is anyone still on threads? What happened to threads? I, I never really, I got on it, because, but like I do my own tweets and things. I never, my staff just would like repost on that. That's the honest Honest truth. Wow. <laughs> wow. That's like a, that's, um, I think, a really ugly admission and a sad, <laughs> sad we have to leave it there. Uh, Congressman Khanna, thank you so much. We'll be back for the rant wheel. We'll be right back. Great. Thank you. Thank you.